I'm back again today with Steve Dawson. If you haven't heard the first half of our interview, go back to Monday's episode and check it out. Uh, Steve is originally from Vancouver and he's now based in Nashville. He is a guitar player, plus he plays a whole bunch of um, like antique sort of guitar based instruments. Um, And he does a lot of producing work. He's got a studio down in Nashville called The Hen House. And uh, so he's, you know, he works both as a player and a producer. And he's just got some really, really interesting perspectives to share. And I can't wait for you to hear it. So let's go. So uh, from, from the perspective of being a player... You write original music, um, but also, and maybe especially because of the genres of music that you explore as an artist being more sort of roots Americana based, it's perhaps a little bit more standard to also work with other people's tunes as well. Um, And you can correct me if I have any of that wrong. But my question is, do you want to talk a little bit about the process of taking someone else's material and making it your own, sort of telling your own story with it? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that is, I don't think you're wrong in saying that. I I don't think it's like a a set thing that people have to do, but it's certainly something that is, that is acceptable in in the genre. And yeah, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, people covering a John Prine song because he writes such great songs or if it's or the, mm-hmm. the the main thing, I guess, is like there's this whole the thing for me is like there's this whole world of traditional music that exists that is mm-hmm. sort of like out there in the public domain. And it's so great that it's worth tapping into. Not certainly not everybody mm-hmm. does it, but I do it. And so, yeah, the process for that, like basically, I don't know, I don't really ever think think about it it's just that i know i ha- i've collected it and i have a lot of material that is like you know from the 1920s 1930s and mm-hmm. and i like it and i've never been interested in playing it exactly the same or anything i always want to do some sort of interpretation of it so you know a lot of that stuff has been mm-hmm. has been approached before like for example on my newest record we do a version of a song called house carpenter and it's one of those songs that like Even in the 30s, there was probably like 20 versions of it. And nobody knows where it came from because it's just sort of become this thing of what it is. But like if you hear Sun House's version of it and then you hear Mississippi John Hurt do it, they sing. It's kind of the same song, but they have all different lyrics. And it's like, well, where did that? He Uh learned it from somewhere in Mississippi and he learned it from somewhere in Georgia. So there's a different set of lyrics. So it's like very very open to interpretation which is nice it's like a blank slate and so yeah i mean if i'm gonna approach a tune like that i always want to find something instrumentally that is interesting to me so for for me to come up with that there was like i was experimenting with a guitar tuning that i wasn't familiar with and i played it on the weisenborn which you were asking about and that's like a lap steel like a lap an acoustic lap steel with a hollow neck and uh oh wow yeah, there's one hanging behind me i don't know if you can see it oh maybe you can't see it no it's out of frame um, but uh so i kind of developed like a guitar riff idea kind of thing that's sort of like reminded me of that and then it was it was sort of a matter of adapting the melody to suit what i was doing and so uh-huh. yeah i mean But I've also played that same song with a guy named Kelly Joe Phelps. And I've also played that song with another person. So, and they did it completely differently from each other as well. So yeah, it's mostly just finding a version that's worth bothering to do because it has been done before. Uh Uh, You know, there's some great versions. There's some not so great versions. You have to kind of feel like your version is worth doing. Um, And I mean, that's really all it is. It's like, it's just another it's just another tune. It's just that that canon of, of American roots music is really deep. And, you know, it's, it's kind of weird to, yeah. in a way to pick a song that's been done a hundred times, like that song when there's like thousands of songs that have never been done. But um, I don't know, there's just something about the mythology in this, in that song in particular that draws people in. And there's a reason for that, that is, mm-hmm pretty deep and when you hear the song it's like oh yeah like that 
it makes sense why that that song has been picked up on more than another one you know so mm-hmm. yeah i mean it's it's kind of easy to lump a lot of that music together and just say like oh it's got three chords and it's sort of a blues thing or whatever but when you start really studying that music you realize you know the level of the of the musicianship that was going on the innovation in the technique there was you know there's stuff mm-hmm. that people were playing in the 30s that nobody's come close to playing technically since um I don't mean that across the board, but for the most part, a lot of that stuff is pretty phenomenal. And if you if you're a guitar player and you pick up an old record by, say, Sun House or by Skip James or by Blind Blake um, and you work on it and try and figure it out like I have, Uh you realize that you can spend your entire life trying to play half as good as those guys did. (laughs) And yeah, and it's just really deep and it's fun to get into and for me it's fun to get into that stuff and learn it and then kind of like let it filter through you and then never do it again because Uh I don't want to I don't want to be like that and I'm certainly not like that in my life and so why would I try and copy that but I find it very engaging music and I want to pick up what I can from people that are doing stuff that sounds so great so I Uh so I learn what I can yeah I think when when we are drawing on uh, those that have come before us, that perspective of doing a deep dive and then letting it filter through and and letting it sort of influence your playing without becoming that that player or influence your singing without becoming that yeah. singer, that kind of thing. I think that's the the value of all the historical music that has come before, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, whether you're talking about jazz or or folk music or whatever it is, there's, yeah, a, yeah. a huge history there of recorded music and, and things that came before recorded music. But if we're talking about the advent of recording, it's from basically the 1920s on. And yeah. so if you limit it to that, there's a finite amount of music, but it's pretty massive and it's um, a great yeah. well of information if you're interested in that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So you recently came back from being up here in BC for a couple of weeks on a short tour, yeah. right? Um, you want to talk about the realities of life on tour and uh, the impact that that sort of has on body and voice touring is not always as pretty as perhaps it seems from afar (laughs) yeah and there can be some harsh realities for singers around vocal fatigue and lifestyle and all that yeah um that's something i've had some experience with and then worked with people who are like far better singers than i am like allison russell who i toured with and she she had that happen where she and actually her partner, JT, who was the other half of Birds of Chicago, he had sort of vocal nodes that he had to get operated on that it was really hard, you know, problematic. Um, she had uh-huh. this thing happen where her voice just gave out and she had all these huge shows to do and she had to pull out of them. Um, and yeah, so, uh, and then working with somebody like Matt Anderson, who has one of the most massive voices I've ever come across in my life. And he just seems to like have a bottomless amount of stamina for it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know where the, I don't know where that difference is, but he can sing louder and harder than anyone I know night after night. And there's like not a problem. It just doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if his technique is so good. You would know a lot more than I would about that. Um, But I kind of think that it's not. I kind of think he doesn't have great technique. He's just sort of like blessed with this voice that can, do crazy stuff that other people's voices can't and he can do it forever and maybe that'll stop one day but uh it seems to be working just fine for him um allison um didn't have you know she i think she had some flawed technique probably that caught up with her i think that's sort of what happened in her case um Uh not that there's anything flawed about the way that it comes across, but like, obviously there's ways to sing properly. And I think she was probably overdoing it and touring a ton. So, yeah, I mean, for me touring these days, it's not, not like what it used to be. And when I was touring a lot, I wasn't really singing. I was singing some backup harmonies and stuff. So there wasn't, Uh and if, if I blew my voice out, nobody was going to be like 
super bummed because that wasn't really my uh-huh. gig, you know? So uh, I, d- I, I never had that issue with uh, being a side person where what, what I had to contribute vocally was so important that it would be uh, a huge problem if I blew my voice out. Uh-huh. So the stamina thing for me is like, it was never really an issue. I never had any physical issues with my hand. I guess I have had some sort of hand wrist things, um, but nothing like super debilitating knock on wood, I guess. Um, uh-huh. I certainly could have. And like hauling gear around is something that, um, you know, yep. if you don't have a crew of people lifting stuff for you, like when I played with, when I was in Matt's band, we kind of did have a, we, we kind of had a crew that would load in all our stuff and carry a bunch of uh-huh. the heavy things. And so I wasn't having to haul my pedal steel around, which weighs, you know, 60 pounds or whatever. Um, oh, but, uh, when I toured with birds of Chicago, it was, I was carrying all my stuff and setting up all my stuff. And, um, yeah, you could easily run into problems with your back, or your wrist, and you have to be aware of that. I was sort of blissfully ignorant, I guess, for the most part, most part. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I just never really, I never really focused too much on health other than staying healthy, like in general, you know, like yeah. I'd go for runs and I'd exercise and things like that. That, be, that, especially as I aged, you know, it's like, you have to kind of stay on top of that, especially if you're on the yeah. road because the food can be shitty. And sometimes mm-hmm. you have to go to bed at two in the morning and get up at five in the morning and things like that, that can definitely yeah. make you unhealthy. Um, yep. But I don't know. I never really had any serious problems. Um, when I, so when I was up in Vancouver, like you mentioned, that's my band and I, and I'm singing and mm-hmm. playing and well, you know, I'm a guitar player and like, you know, I don't pretend to be the world's greatest vocalist or anything like that, or even in the top 20,000, but singing (laughs) is part of what I do in my show. And I feel okay about, I feel fine about where my, my skills as a vocalist are. Um, and it gets, Mm -hmm. it gets me where I need to go, but it's really like my guitar playing is the important thing for me. And, and, um, I do have, um, sort of like, I would say, I don't think it's a physical issue. I think it's a, like a mental block of some sort that manifests itself. And it's like totally a post COVID thing. This never used to happen to me, but post COVID there's Mm -hmm. some sort of trauma or whatever that now when I go on tour, I have this added element of like stress that manifests itself in my throat. And Mm -hmm. every time now happens, like if I'm here at home, like I am now, I'm totally fine. And I actually, I was as I was concerned enough about it to go and see an ENT, your nose throat doctor, and he yeah. stuck a camera down my throat and he's like, "You're fine." Um, so I, which is the right call. By yeah, the way. I think you. If something is happening sure. on repeat, yeah. that is absolutely the right call. I yeah. did go to see him like well, at, like I was not close on either side to touring, so like maybe I had done some damage yeah. and it was kind of sorted itself out. But he basically said, "You're uh-huh. fine physically." But still, like, you know, three weeks later, I went on tour and, like, without fail, two or three days before the tour, my throat starts hurting, uh, it gets dry, and then I start worrying, like, am I going to lose my voice, which, like, isn't maybe the end of the world musically. I could still do a show instrumentally and feel good about it, but, like, it would be a problem. You know, I've got a band, we've got songs to play, (laughs) and... And one time I lost my voice and it was at a, we we were doing a session in Vancouver, not this time, but like a year ago. And I'd been rehearsing and doing another project and doing another session. And then I came into my session and I'd blown mm-hmm. my voice out. And I wasn't, that's not totally surprising because the amount of stuff going on with like lack of sleep and like mm-hmm. organizing things and talking through a rehearsal and like doing all that stuff. Yeah. But almost exclusively all these problems that come up in my throat that I consider important and stressful to me, it never, it never actually transpires into anything. It just, it's the cause, it's the cause of, of a great deal of stress (laughs) and I can't figure out how to fix it. So that's like, that's what I battle with now is like this sort of, I wouldn't say it's crippling, but it's like, it's a problem for me and I don't know what the answer is. And 
I don't know. Maybe there is an answer. Maybe there's not. Maybe I just have to battle through it. I'm not really sure. But technically, physically, I think there's nothing wrong with me. I think it's it's all just some sort of emotional roller coaster going on in my head that gets that spirals out of control. And usually it it ends up okay. Yeah. Well, I I mean, I think we could go deep into that, yeah. but we probably don't have enough time <laughs> today in in the podcast to do that, but it would be interesting to um, you know, to do that work. What I what I see is in like in my work as a vocal coach is that the stuff that shows up in our voice is usually paralleled in our lives for, for starters. Yeah. So, um, you know, if and and vice versa. So, if there's concerns around stuff to do with touring that you know maybe are as a result of COVID and some some trauma that we've um, experienced through that and and fears that now come up around travel and being yeah. around people and you know whatever those things can absolutely show up in our voices and also our voices are like they our throat is the I don't know if you get into this stuff, but if you look at chakras, like it, it's everything filters through. And then it's this like little tiny, Yeah, <laughs> everything's funneling through, but it's this little tiny gateway in your throat and it all, um, it, it can, re- there can be a huge squeeze there. And I have seen that very much manifest, not to get too woo woo, but I have definitely seen that manifest is just a lot of tension in there yeah. that can show up as soreness vocal fatigue, all sorts of things. Sure. And um and and those things can be come at in a number of different ways, even if it's nothing structurally that you would see with a camera down your throat that is like quote unquote wrong with your yeah. voice. And you said something earlier around vocal technique when you were talking about the other singers. And I would just mention that the voice science has come to a place where we talk a lot less about like good technique and bad technique. And we talk a lot more about sustainable right. technique, yeah. right? Like there's, there's kind of, when you take the, the long view of it, there's not so much a thing about good technique and bad technique. What it is, is are what you are doing, is that a thing that is sustainable? Right. And that is where you can get in trouble. And also there's a piece of genetics that sometimes totally. is just a bit inexplicable. Yeah. Like with Matt Anderson. Right? So those guys, when I, when I look yeah. at him, I'm like, there is no way that's sustainable. It's like a thunderingly powerful voice. And it's just like, it's phenomenal. But you, you look at him on, I look over at him on stage and I'm like, there's no way he's going to be able to talk after the show. He's going so hard and then he's totally fine. It's just like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. And then the, the next day is no problem. <laughs> well, I mean, you look historically at the the folks who can drink a fifth of Jack and smoke right. three packs a day and have no problems and still be singing their hearts out in their 80s. And then you have people who have really delicate voices and they're doing all the right things and all the right care. Mm-hmm. And they have voices that are delicate and have problems a lot more easily throughout their lives, even though they're doing all the quote unquote right yeah. things. So there has to be a piece of genetics, yeah. but that's, that's the piece that's uncontrollable. Right. The, what we do with it is the piece that's controllable. Totally. Yeah. yeah. You have your own podcast, Music Makers and Soul Shakers. I do. You want to talk about what inspired you to start that and talk a bit about your show? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's been going for six seasons now. I'm about to start the seventh. And yeah. um, it was kind of brought on because I, I've, I'm i a bit of a podcast junkie. Like I listen to them yeah. a fair amount, you know, when I'm driving or when I'm out for a run or thing. That's what I listen to more than music. Like I, do, yep. I don't really like listening to music in the car. So I end up listening. Podcasts for me is what fills a lot of that space. Um, and some of the shows that I really liked would bring musicians on and then they would never talk about the things that I thought they should talk about or they just didn't go very deep or it was like yep. hey so you you know like just sort of surfacey questions about road stories or something but it never really yep. got into yep. the yep. meat of you know making records and like talking about stuff that I wanted to hear about and so I just decided to mm-hmm. do it myself and so it started yeah in 2016 I started it and um 
uh, it was meant sort of like what yours is, like long form conversational, but that we would mm -hmm. really delve into the process of making records for not not mm -hmm. only that, but like that's sort of the heavily, heavily favored topic of conversation, I guess, but without getting yeah. technical. I didn't want it. I didn't want to get bogged down in like, mm -hmm. what kind of microphone do you use and what kind of strings do you like? I didn't want to talk about gear. So I basically never yeah. talk about gear. It's all like approaches and like, um, yeah, just different than equipment because I think there's more, more to yeah. it than that. Yeah, yeah. And so... Uh, it, yeah, it sort of started like Bill Frizzell was the first person I had on and I had a season of 20 shows or something like that and just launched them and I figured I would do it and just sort of see what happens and then it was successful enough like I don't mean financially successful because podcasting does not exactly uh, <laughs> change your life financially but uh, I'm well yeah. aware <laughs> um, but it was sustainable to it like it's basically like a it's basically like a hobby, I guess, is what it, what, how I consider it. Yeah. Because, but it's sort of a time suck of a hobby because uh, I do put a lot yeah. of effort into it, and it takes a lot of time. And you know, setting people up, and then like something happens, and you have to change the schedule. Like it's time consuming. I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, and so you're preaching to yeah. the choir. <laughs> um, but I've figured out a way to kind of coexist with it, and I feel like it's worth it. It's opened up doors to me to work with people from unusual places and some yeah. there's just been a lot of paths that I can trace back to the podcast and people that I've met around the world yeah. from doing it. And so for me it is um worth it's worth the hassle of of what it all means. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy the conversational part. It's like it's just all the yeah. other bullshit that like of setting it up and like yeah you know i i try and get sponsors so i i'm sort of chasing down people to give me money basically to do it and that can be a mm -hmm. real grind um but i try and do that once a year and then and then listeners support me with patreon and things like that so i have i have mm -hmm. little streams of income that sort of make uh you know and there's as you know too there's like hard costs involved and things like that so mm -hmm. i i can get all that stuff covered and you know it's sort of a, it's just like a reliable thing that I can do. And I spend, I try and get all the interviews done usually in like January and February. So I'm not doing it all through the year. So I bank them all up mm -hmm. and then start a new season. So yeah, I've, I've got a new season coming up. Uh, it starts in a couple of weeks and I've done most of the interviews for the whole season already. So there's going to be 20 new episodes, but I drop them every mm -hmm. two weeks basically. So once, once they yeah. start in June, they'll come out every two weeks. And so they'll carry over until January or something like that. And then, yeah. and then I don't know, I never know if I'm going to do it again, but uh, yeah. um, as long as they're, you know, originally my concept was to talk to people that had been doing it for like 50 years. So it was like, I, I wasn't talking mm -hmm. to anyone that was under like 60 and that to me was the most interesting. And then I started talking to younger people as well and people my own age. And that was also interesting in different ways. You know, it's way different talking to somebody who's only been, who's only made three records than it is yeah. talking to a guy that's played on 800 records. So <laughs> that to me is also really interesting. Just finding, finding out interesting things about people so yeah like a, a lot of it is a bit of a grind like trying to find the guests uh, most people that i have on the show i end up e it's mostly people that i've either worked with or have some direct connection to because yeah i don't know going through managers and agents and stuff can be really soul-sucking because a lot of them just don't respond or they or they say oh that would be really cool let's do that and then you, and then you never hear from them again <laughs> like that, that kind of thing happens yeah. enough where it's yeah. like if i don't have to deal with a manager or a publicist i'm gonna not do that so i end up like talking to artists directly and that's mostly through like my work as a musician or producer either yep. i've worked with somebody or i know somebody that's worked with somebody so almost that's not always the case but like 70 percent of it is done that way where yeah. i'm not doing it from a publicity point of view and you, and i also try it's and it's not a complete cold yeah, call and i also try and not make it about like their new record and yeah but now that they're now that the podcast has been out for six years i get hit up by publicists all the time mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily somebody that i'm super aware of or interested in or like 
you know, if it's, but what their angle always is, is like this guy has a new single or this woman has a new album or whatever it is. Uh Uh, But that's not really what I want to talk to them about. Like I, I don't really care yeah. that they have a new single out. Uh, I want to talk about something they did 15 years ago, maybe, or whatever. Yeah. So, I, uh, yeah, I just sort of avoid those situations as much as I can and just talk to people that... That's another good way to kind of connect with people, too, is like when they're not in the cycle of promoting a new record. Yeah. And they have uh, time and you can... Because when people are promoting a record, they get into these ruts of talking about the same thing over and over again and even and even like developing a storyline that may or may not be super accurate that that to me is Uh not very interesting so when you catch somebody kind of off guard Uh or not in the promotional record promotion mode they can be way more engaged in the process so that's what i try and tap into i guess and so yeah i've done 140 episodes or something and this will be another 20 and we'll see what happens after that nice And you utilize Patreon to support yep. um, your podcast. Yep. And I'm a bit surprised to say it, but I believe that you are the first guest I've had on the show who makes use of anything along those lines. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, there's different versions. Of Patreon is one of yep. them, but there's different versions of that same yep. concept. Um, I think it's an incredibly smart way to sort of build your brand and community at the same time. Yep. Do you want to talk a little bit about your experience of using a platform like that and at what point it made sense to incorporate it? Well, it makes sense right away, really, I think, because you have nothing to lose. There's no cost to it. Okay. So, you know, what you're what you're looking for is people that you know, I think the idea where Patreon works for something like this, like for a podcast, is if you get a large number of people kicking in a couple bucks a month instead of uh-huh. five people kicking in a hundred bucks a month, you know, like, yeah. So if you can convince people that listen to your show and, you know, as you, part of that is like regular, you know, I have this two week interval and people get used to that and they expect you know, they expect there to be a new show every two weeks and then it comes out and they're like Mm -hmm. engaged in that because that's what's happening. And that along with that, that builds like, uh, you know, a fan of your show. And if somebody's a fan of the show, they might be inclined to, to support it. And if that means three bucks a month, so be it. That's, you know, it's more than Mm -hmm. more than zero bucks a month. And so the idea with Patreon is that you get enough of these people supporting your show and your endeavors in that regard. And you can have a somewhat reliable, steady stream of income. It's just another stream of income, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, for me, it fluctuates wildly. It's pretty solid all through the season. And then when I stop doing it, you know, like my season ended in Mm -hmm. March, I guess. And so I haven't done it for April or May and I'll go half a June. So that's like two and a half months where I don't do it. And people just totally like bail on you at that (laughs) that point, Yeah, which is understandable. But I I try and talk about it and I'm like, hey, this is actually when I'm doing the most work and I can still use the dough. So if it, if it doesn't, if five bucks a month isn't really like breaking your bank, I would, I would encourage you to keep forking it over because it helps me out and I got expenses and I'm doing all this work. So whatever, you know, like I have no, there's no requirement to use it. Um, and people uh-huh. generally assume that podcasting is a free endeavor and it is for the most part, but I think people need to stick. It is. Yeah. It like <laughs> it need people need to step up for things like that these days. And it's not that much money to kick in a few bucks a month. And, um, you know, that's the price of, of a free market like this like podcasting is yeah it's it's gonna change at some point and it may stop being free i don't know how it's gonna play out but maybe it won't but yeah we need to have some sort of support or it becomes a yeah. pod- like i wouldn't do it if i didn't have some money coming in for it i wouldn't be able yeah. to it just wouldn't make any sense i would be losing money doing it and i don't want to do that so i yeah my being my first season this year, I've definitely just been losing yeah. money. <laughs> Straight yeah. up. Well, I didn't losing I money. Didn't, but I've been doing it as a passion project and totally working towards starting to figure out how to, you know, monetize it down the road. Yeah, I probably went two or three years without even thinking about that. And then I was like, 
actually, I got to sort this out because like at the time I was spending yeah. tons of time editing and I don't do that anymore really. Um, but it was really time consuming and I was making, generating no money doing it. So it was purely uh -huh. like a hobby. So now it's like a, uh -huh. now I think of it as like a hobby that sort of pays for itself, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. If it breaks even, that's all right. I actually partway into this uh, season, because uh, I started out editing everything myself yeah. and I can do the physical editing, yeah. but any of the like, plugins kind of stuff to make it sound yeah. better i'm at, like at sea i don't know what i'm yeah. doing um and part way through this season i hired an editor kurt mass who uh, that has been a godsend yes. to me to be able to send it out and he edits it and it comes back and i upload it and i don't have to deal with that part of it because that hands down was the oh, biggest yeah time suck yeah. of the whole endeavor yeah. yeah yeah that takes a huge yeah. amount of time especially when you're when you're doing long form stuff like this where it's yeah. not just like a five minute song it's like an hour and a half or whatever yeah. it is and you have to deal with all that audio so yeah you need to have somebody well i say that but i do it all myself still <laughs> i had a, i had a yeah. guy a couple <laughs> years ago but yeah i just yeah i for for now i just do it myself because i also like I'm only doing 20 episodes. It's not like um, Mark Marin or something where he's doing two shows a week. I'm doing... That's what I'm doing. Yeah, that's a lot. So yeah, you need somebody that's got your back to to um, look after some of that stuff. Yeah. But, but for I me, mean, it's like... I yeah. do one interview that gets split into two episodes, right. but yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm just, yeah, just saying like once every two weeks, I put aside an afternoon and I can knock one out you know and in, in an afternoon and yeah so that's what i try and do but yeah i guess in a perfect world i would not have to do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I feel you on uh, that. um and i was recently talking to someone about you and i can't remember who this was actually but um and they commented on the fact that you've really built a community um, through your music, your podcast, everything that you do. Do you want to talk about that aspect of building a community? Yeah, I mean, I if it's there, I am not hyper aware of it. But mm -hmm. I mean, I, ha I have developed a crew of people that I use and I guess gainfully employ when I can to do work with me. And that feels like a community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm talking about recording. Um, yeah. And with gigs, obviously, I have a crew of people that I use for that. Some of them overlap and some of them don't. And I feel like that's sort of its own little micro community. With the podcast, um, like during the pandemic, I was really trying to get people to engage in the show. And that worked to a certain extent. I was, you know, I opened up, I didn't have like live callers, but I had, I had a phone that would take messages and people would uh -huh. call in. And we would just kind of like debrief about where things were at with music and all that stuff. And that, and that worked during the pandemic, but I don't do that anymore because it's just kind of, yeah. I, so when I, the crazy thing for me though, is like when I look at my um, stats, which for podcasting, they're getting yeah. a little bit better. They used to be just so vague. You couldn't really tell what was going on, but now it's yeah. to the point where you can sort of get a feel for like what's happening out there with your show. And that's, that to me always like really blows my mind. Like, you know, there's like 400 people from Sweden listen to my show. It's like, yeah. <laughs> it blows my mind. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't really try and engage with people as much as maybe I could or I should. So I don't hear from that many people all that often, but I, I do enough for me to be aware that, that it's, you know, some people really enjoy the show and they like to listen to it and they like to expect to hear it. And so that's cool. Um, and yeah, definitely mm -hmm. like all over the world, it, you know, it, it's definitely strongest in the United States, followed by Canada, followed by Ireland, followed by the UK, followed by Sweden. And then from there, it's like, you know, small, but the Sweden th or Australia is in there mm -hmm. too, but they're all a substantial amount of amount of listeners. And so, yeah, I've just switched my podcast over to a new host and I'm curious to see, like they have mm -hmm. a different way of reporting what's happening with your show so uh -huh. i'm interested to see how that 
changes what I'm actually seeing. You know, yeah. it was all, like it was mostly because Apple and Spotify held it really close. They didn't. They just didn't want to share the information. I know, just don't. And they still don't, <laughs> but you can sort of yep. get an idea now, like with, you know, at yeah. least geographically what's happening, um, sort of the demographics, but that's, I don't really believe that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting and it's great to see, like what you can do is find out how many times your show has been downloaded. And that's that's the ultimately uh-huh. the number that, that people are going to see and care care yeah. about if you're you know wanting to get advertisers or something like that so yeah that's um it's it's interesting and so if yeah community wise i don't know i mean i in 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 the ways that i keep coming back to people and using i don't always use the same people but i i definitely feel like there's a community of of like-minded individuals that i've tapped into that i'm comfortable mm-hmm. with and we enjoy working together and um yeah, I guess the podcast in its own way has developed some sort of thing too. Yeah. Well, I know our conversation has gone all over the map today, which I kind of love yeah. actually. Um, but do you think there's anything else that's really important for up and coming artists to know that we just haven't touched on today? Um, well, you know, I, I think some of it ties back to what I was saying about how things have changed is that um, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, like we're talking about music here for the most part and, or at least everything sort of stems from that. And um, as I was saying, like the, the whole thing of playing live gigs was really the way that I learned how to do what I do. And from that, it's like everything that I do now is is sort of an offshoot of that in one way or another. And um, I still think that's important. I just think people have to, young people have to figure out probably some new ways of pulling that off. But like, there's no, in my mind, there's no shortcut through the, the um, cutting your teeth part of like being out there doing yeah. gigs. And like, it's so important to, to have that experience, get out of the, get out of your bedroom and like, play some shows and that means different things to different people but and i know the opportunities aren't the same as what they were but to me that's like still such an important part of developing as a musician into whatever it may be Uh if you want to be an engineer or a producer or a musician or a teacher or whatever you know i still think that that's kind of a key element that i think people are aware of the importance of it but it seems to get downplayed a little bit and I guess that's uh-huh. what I would say is like still the most important thing is like spending that time ideally in a situation where there's some performance involved. Uh, and it's not just about uh-huh. like the, the audience or the crowd. It's like about learning how to communicate and, and, you know, work out arrangements with people and figure out how music works. There's no, uh, there's no other way of doing it than just diving in there and yeah. you know, getting it done. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I I totally agree with you. I I there's no way around it. You got to get out there and do yep. it. Yep. Totally. So where can people find you, Steve? All the socials and the the web and all that. Yeah, I mean, I'm on uh Instagram, Facebook. Um I think the or the Instagram thing is easy. Um I think it's just Steve Dawson Music. Facebook is something Steve Dawson ish. <laughs> not sure. Uh, my web- <laughs> I'll look it up. I'll put it in the my show. My website notes. is stevedawson.ca and that has links to all that stuff. Um, I'm pretty active on YouTube as well. Um, I haven't been for a couple months, but that's something that I do a fair amount of. Um, so uh-huh. I have a channel there. Um, I think it's Steve Dawson Music. Uh, again, that all those links are on my website. And. I'm I'm not active at all on Twitter, but I do have a Twitter handle. Um, I think it's nail nailbiter sixteen, but I don't. I just Twitter to me hasn't done my hasn't really like been much of a thing for me. Yeah. So I don't really do that. Um, but my Instagram is pretty engaged, and Facebook sort of it's been less lately. But um, I'm I'm mm-hmm. fairly uh, active on there. But YouTube tends to be the thing where I'm doing more stuff these days. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I've really enjoyed this me too. conversation. Yeah, 
Absolutely. You're welcome. Long and winding totally. road. <laughs> uh, thanks for asking me and nice to talk to you again after a long time.